and the four young candidates with us. And thank you for the slice of aid. There was a lot of function here earlier this morning. Thank you so much for coming out. And of course, you can see our moderator in this uh, segment today, Mr. Herbert Shamba. And our candidates, as you can see over here, we have with us in place of um, Ms. Sayasi. Uh, Kofel is her running name, Mr. Kanagata. And then we have seated next to his left is candidate Mona Barnes. Correct? Very good. And seated to her left is Ms. Scallion. Sheila. Sheila Scallion. And we thank all of them for joining us today. And we're happy to give you the opportunity to hear these candidates plan for the Virgin Islands or what you're going to do individually uh, should either of them become our next governor. And it's a pleasure having you here with us today. Um, we will now give the candidates three minutes each for their opening statement. I will start with Mr. Kanagata and we'll work our way over. Good afternoon. Well, my name is John Kanagata and I'm represented in the Lieutenant Governor portion of the Cold Health Kanagata team. We're a team that comes together because we have a vision. We have a vision that we're announced to be the economic powerhouse of the Caribbean. And how are we going to do that? We have to be the example, set the example of our team. One of the first things we've done is we've waged a war on corruption. Although energy is one of our most important platform issues, we believe in corruption. People come up to us and tell us that corruption is hampering the progress of the Virgin Islands moving forward. It steals away not just from the middle end, but from the poor people. And those individuals are being trampled in our, in our society. And we want to be not just for the rich of the middle class, but for the poor. We want to be for the disabled, those who work hard, and those who are not able to work. We're a team, like many other teams, that's going to bring honesty and integrity. We see a lot of new faces today. No incumbents, no recyclees in politics, but three new faces that come in before you to ask you humbly for your support on November 1st, excuse me, November 4th, for, for the position of double lieutenant governor. We believe that energy is going to propel us into this century. Right now, we're paying 54 cents a kilowatt. Our neighbor next door, say in Puerto Rico, who is in total competition with us, their vision is to get their energy costs below 16 cents. Right now, with the Vital Project and the Propane Project, we're expecting it down to about 30%. That is not going to do it. In addition to the investment in Vital, we have to invest in the people, the people of WAPA who can make the equipment more efficient. Because if we change our fuel and not change our culture, our mindset, we are going to be in the same spiral of indefinite. We're asking for support because we're also here to put an emphasis on education. If our children are not reading at proficient levels in the third grade, we are failing them. Common Core education is what we've accepted as the norm because the federal government throws money. And Common Core education focuses, it focuses on testing and it's not tested as the critical thinking that we have to instill in our children. So between an emphasis on education, energy, and fighting corruption, we believe we'll be able to instill our vision that the Bodge Lands can and will be the economic powerhouse of the storage mines. We ask you once again for your support on November 4th for the Soraya Nassi Koto and John Candy the team. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Candy. And now, Mona Barnes. Good afternoon. I am gubernatorial candidate Mona Barnes. I first want to uh, recognize my lieutenant governor that is here with me, Dr. Winnie Corner. <laughs> the Barnes Corps team, as we continue to say, is a team of leaders. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am Sergeant Major Barnes as well. I was the first female state command Sergeant Major for the Virgin Islands. I'm also a pastor, I'm a past educator. I taught at the Purdue Law School for 12 years. I have my own environmental company, MSH Enterprises, which we specialize in underground storage time monitoring. Dr. Corbin is a naturopathic physician, as well as she has her own practice. She is also a 
teacher uh, in all states uh, in St. Thomas, and she was also working at uh, UVI as a director of the spirituality and also uh, organization, leadership and organization at the university. We decided to run for these offices because we saw a downward trend in the quality of life for the people of the Virgin Islands. And there are critical areas within our community and if anyone becomes insolvent, uh, the Virgin Islands is really going to be in a very, very bad place. There are five areas that we're concentrating that, that is just the only five. But look, the key is uh, the energy crisis. And as far as the energy crisis is concerned, the Barnes Forum team, we truly believe that there is a solution uh, to that problem based on information that has already been given, recommendations that have been given, and some have been uh, done and others have not. Though they have already begun to diversify in the water and power authority, we truly believe that hydrogen technology is another way that we can actually ease the burden of the, the customers and then improve your quality of life because I know some of you pay five and six hundred dollars uh, for your bottle bill, which is truly unacceptable. The other area that we are very focused on is economic development and not just big business, we are very centralized on small business because that's what drives uh, our economy. We really are looking forward to an agricultural authority. We believe when we begin to feed ourselves, to take care of ourselves. Then again, the money continues to circulate again. You don't have to pay the high cost for, for food that is coming in. You're going to have a healthier community. As a teacher, education, of course, we have to do some restructuring in the way we are teaching our children. And I truly believe as we raise uh, or we lower the poverty level and raise the quality of life, then we're going to say decrease in crime because they're very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Again, together. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheila Scullion. I've lived here for about 22 years. I decided about four years ago to run for governor because I feel very deeply that we're not really on the right path and that we really are at a critical time try to make things much better for people here in the Virgin Islands. Right now, I think the most serious issues are crime, WAPA, and reforming the GERS system. But aside from that, my, um, my main passion, what I think will really help people in the next 20 years, is a real focus on health care. I was one of the people who tried to get that medical school going and really bring it here to St. Croix. I think they didn't make the right decision and there's still a little bit of hope. Um, I feel that there needs, they need to develop an alternative curriculum within the medical school which helps to really focus on the truth. I think there are local products that could be developed there are new treatments that could be developed. We need to really study this and document very carefully over about 20 year period and look at the different diseases like autoimmune disease, cancer, mental health, all of the diseases and try to collect the data necessary for a very strong foundation for the future. So um, I hope that you will be very serious with your vote at this particular point in time. I'm running with Robert Quinn as Lieutenant Governor, and my name is Sheila Scullion. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Herbert Shambon will now um, take us on and the rest of the board. And Mr. Herbert Shambon, I want you to give a short introduction of yourself, just a minute or two, if I did not, but I'm sure you could I want to thank you for that. 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 I want to th
because we're in crisis mode right now, people have lost faith in the process. Hopefully they will have faith in some of the counties so they it. And that the voters will not be thwarted and will mean something when the votes are counted. Um, basically, I've been here since 1968, the longest reigning Republican. No. <laughs> <laughs> the party that I joined when I came here was the Melvin Evans Republican Group, and it's been running strong ever since. Not due to any effort of my own, but still the party stays on and followed by people like C. Lloyd A. Joseph, the founder of the West End News, Stanley Fairley, a U.S. Marshal, and uh, of course Melvin Evans, and all the other Republicans that took part in making the first elected Republican governor a Republican. The first elected, re elected governor a Republican, which was not possible according to the Oz factors. They said there's no way in the world you're going to be Alexander Perry, a serial killer. But it happened. And with that Republican administration, we saw roads, we saw buildings, we saw infrastructure, we saw schools, we saw a power plant being built in the South Shore. We saw lights going up all over the place. Major, major commitment to not only the present needs, but the future needs. So I've been with them ever since and have participated in most of the uh, national conventions. Uh, the last two as a member of the platform committee and uh, looking forward to uh, being part of the continuing growth of the Republican Party as we, as the public politicians always say, as we move forward. And that's a catchy phrase, but what does it mean? Well, it means that I'm here today and I'm going to ask some questions and some of them are going to be controversial, so let's see what they are. A two minutes reply and one minute rebuttal from each of the answer answers. And the first question will start here with my right. Large businesses are coming off of off a grid. Most of those businesses are tax exempt. How do you plan to get any revenue from those businesses to help with the shortfall of our government? I guess assuming because they're tax exempt, because they've taken advantage of the tax exempt offerings that were made to them by the government. How are you going to get money out of it? Well, that's a difficult question. If the, if the government governor has already given that tax exempt status, then it's really not fair to try to take more money from them. I feel that there's a real trend in the world and the Virgin Islands where the government is taking too much money from, from people. And I feel that they're in denial at the top. I don't think they really comprehend what the average people are really going through. If your salary is $200,000, that's, that's much different than if you're bringing $11,000. And I think in this particular community, we're not a community of very, very wealthy people. It's, they're just very normal, average people. So I would say that if the government really made, if the governor made that decision to try to save people a little money, then that's good. So my follow-up to you is that a deal is a deal. What you're saying is once you make this offer, it would be disingenuous, perhaps illegal to claw back and tell these people you've given an advantage to that you can't have it anymore because of government, government is short of cash. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, do, you, do you need me to repeat the question? Should be good. You broke it. Okay, I can give you Thank one. you. Okay, you're fine. Sure. The, the question is, large businesses are coming off a wap up off a of grid, and the way this question was written, I see one. the way this question was written is that it doesn't really join together, but I didn't write the question. But, uh, coming off a of of grid, they're coming off for survival, obviously. I think we all agree on that. But those businesses, those businesses that are coming off a of grid, according to the question, are tax exempt. How do you plan to get any revenues from those businesses to help with the shortfall of our government's offers. Well, if we have already given them a benefit, 
the triangle and then you get your city revenue. I think what has to happen is you then have to go back and have a collaborative sit down effort with them to probably give to different parts of the, the community, whether it's incentives, whether it is to the schools or to other um, organizations. But you, you can't tell someone that they're entitled to something and they try to force them to go back and give. Revenue. What we can do is sit with them, with them their, the stakeholders, find out the needs of the Virgins, and try to get them to channel them towards needs within the Virgin Islands. But you can't, like you say, a deal is a deal. You can't tell somebody you want them to give something and then try to force them to give you revenue. That doesn't work. Sergeant to make it hard to follow up on that. Uh, if you put your hand up on the closer to the top, the antenna to that unit is in the bottom. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure what you say. That's coming from the electronic thing. That's the one thing I do know. At any rate, a follow-up on that is, you didn't mention anything about the job creation of businesses that get tax exemptions as one of the great benefits to the tax Well, Mr. Shannon, I'll try to just answer your question. Now, okay. if, you speak of, if you want to speak, I can go to, to speak on that. But it was the specific question was towards the businesses and then you know asking them to come back and do something else. So I, I answered directly to the question. Yes, but if you desire me to speak about economic development, you know, and a plan that the Barnes Forum team has to uh, bring jobs to the Virgin Islands, then that's a very different question. Okay, my final point there was that the businesses that are in tax exemption and that are leaving the Wapa Bridge are doing so for survival so they can keep employees on the payroll and every employee they can keep on the payroll is a benefit to help the government shortfall. And I agree with you. Okay, John Kanegata, I've given you a good answer. Now you give me repeat what I have to say. <laughs> uh, I think her repeats of the other governor candidate, he's answering your questions and moderated at the same time. <laughs> I do. So, I've always worked in a private sector, and I believe that having a strong private sector is what's important, small business or large business. I think the large businesses are getting off the grid because of the root cause that they're paying 54 cents a kilowatt. Cruise Normand probably in 1990 was paying about 15 cents a kilowatt. And all these years later, now they're paying 54 cents a kilowatt. There's been a loss of business a loss of tax that can or invested in their people invested back in the community. Businesses are coming off the grid, primarily Diageo, who's now using a gas turbine, and who's around probably within a year. That's the other business that's going to be off the, the grid. We lost approximately four megawatts worth of revenues coming to Wapa. The reason why they've done that is I think the leadership of Wapa has been irresponsible in not being able to manage your people, manage the equipment, and manage this energy crisis probably in a better fashion. So now companies are forced to go out with it. Now we can focus also on the federal government. I think of the travesty to allow the district court about 1.5 megawatts of credits to get off. So they're net metering. When they're net metering, they're burning electricity out of water, but they're receiving all the credits as a result of their investment in their solar panels. Those credits should have gone to the hospital, which should invest in a solar power to the hospital, so the federal government wouldn't have reaped the benefits where local industry and local people and local government should have reaped the benefits from that. So in regards to going back to negotiation, I don't think it's the government's responsibility to do that. It's the government's responsibility to create an environment which generates business and makes it easy for business to work so we can keep people employed. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, the question uh, is, is confusing because it seems to be a quick pro quo the question between leaving the water bridge uh, out of necessity, out of survival, uh, as both big businesses do, and, and the fact that should you be then required to dip into your pocket for removal of some of the tax benefits because you are leaving WAPA in order to survive, and that's the, the, the question, I just want to point of criticism. You have been named as an energy czar by your, by your running mate, uh, but you need to understand that if you're going to be the energy czar, power is measured in kilowatt hours, not in kilowatts. Okay? If I may say something, Mr. Sure. Shamba, because... Um... Go ahead. 
if, if, if the question is asked, then the question is answered. Um, when you say that businesses are coming out in here to survive, that might not necessarily be the case. Because some of the businesses are surviving already. It's just a benefit for them to get more money. So we have to make sure that when we're making, when we're making statements that they come from a level of fact. Because my business could be flourishing, and if I have the opportunity to go on the eatery and I can afford it and save even more money that I can then in turn increase the salaries for my employees, increase the resources, increase production. If I have that opportunity, then I will do it. So the thought that every business in the Virgin Islands that's getting off the grid is for survival, I would say to you that's not the case. Okay, I hope you're applauding. How many people even applaud for me or a cheer or a cheer or a boo is me? Okay? The, the, the only only thing I wanted to add is that the government itself has been encouraging businesses to develop the grid. And they have been doing so by rebates, by tax advantages, and it's kind of an interesting disjointed scenario when you tell somebody, get off the grid and save the power plant, and then if you do, we're going to punish you. But let me stop interjecting my own remarks. Because I'm probably one of the worst debaters in the crowd. So. <laughs> you can applaud for that, please. Okay. Let me go to the next question, and I will. I will remember I'm not on the talk show. Now. <laughs> this is to the governors, and the question is: We have so many black history books written by Virgin Islanders. When will we see those books in our public school libraries? And is this the responsibility? of the administration to make that assurance. Sheila, first. I would say it is a responsibility of the administration and the administration should ask the librarians to take charge of that and I can't see why that would be any problem at all. Again, you think the administration should tell the librarians what books to put on the library? Is that what you meant? No, what I'm saying is that if these people want those books in the library, then the administration would communicate to the librarians that that needs to be done, that's what the people would like, and just keep it simple. Sergeant Major? Command Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Um, concerning the books that have been written by Virgin Islanders, even if the books are written, the first thing we're going to have to do is assess the books to ensure that whatever book they're using is one for the grade level, and two, if it's not the grade level, the content of what is in the book. So what I would say is the Department of Education is going to have to sit down with the Board of Education as well and actually have a, a round table, stakeholders again, teachers, administrators, librarians, whomever, to sit down and actually go through the books. And if it is that it can be a benefit to the people and the children of the Virgin Islands, then by all means, I, I would love to see the books of Virgin Islands in the public schools and private schools as well. Okay, I don't, I don't have a follow-up to that. Go ahead, uh, I'm kind of getting it. Sure. I, think, I think the emphasis needs to be on VI history. In regards to having the books come, and obviously it would have to be evaluated. Like every book that comes into the curriculum in any public school in America has to be evaluated. But have there been great authors? Absolutely. There have been authors like Mr. Schrader who continues to put books out there on our culture, and Mr. Moorhead. And obviously, my grandfather, Dr. Kennedy, at the same point in the 20th century. And Mr. Otley, Trials and Triumphs. So I think those are interesting books. But on what level do we plan to bring them in? I know when I attended Pro Lars and also St. Dunstan's, we had Caribbean history as a part of our, of our curriculum. There was a book, I remember it was a very it was a soft covered book that had all of the historical forefathers, you know, from the, from the early the early 60s, 50s, 40s. I would like to see those books, like you said, revived and put back into the libraries. I believe we need to have more Caribbean history and VI history in particular into our curriculums to teach us about our forefathers. I think a lot of the violent crimes, a lot of the drug sales, 
we kill each other because we don't understand who we are. We came from very proud individuals, some from slaves, some from free slaves, some from Europeans, some from Spaniards. And once we understand the greatness of what we come from, I think you'll have an impact. And the result of that is going to be by teaching our children about ourselves and where we came from. Thank right. you. Uh, I just want to inject one thing. You know, some of the folks, who can, Boyer, uh, Highfield, uh, and Richard Schwab, you can buy online for a dollar. Uh, I just wish more of the public would buy pets, so uh, if they put online and just donate them to the libraries of the schools, uh, that would not require a lot of money. A lot of these books are not in, in print right now, not available commercially, and that uh, the libraries would have difficulty getting them. But citizens, different story. But anyway, let me get to the next question. All right, here we go. During the First Amendment agreement, I guess an extension agreement for prevention regarding in lieu of property taxes, that was an amendment to the extension agreement, they had ownership of three properties. Those throughout the years, they, they purchased two additional properties, a state school, a state cottage, a housing community was built in a state college, cottage, the value of land was elevated because the types of homes that were built there stand hurricanes and earthquake disasters. Hurry, I'm having a hard time understanding what you're saying. Okay, let me, let me repeat again. During the original amendment agreement for Hovenda, regarding in lieu of property taxes, they had ownership of three properties. Throughout the years, they purchased two additional properties in the state world, the state college, and a housing community was built at the State College of Cottage. The value of the land was elevated because of the types of the very strong houses that were built to withstand hurricanes and earthquakes. The question is, if Ovenza properties are sold in this new agreement coming up, what plans are in place through the tax assessor's office when it comes to giving tax breaks in lieu of taxes to that new company who's yet to be announced or described? And since uh, you worked at Hovenza, maybe you could explain in your answer a little bit about Coral Cottage and, uh, and those houses that are there. I'm not sure if that went into Anstead, but obviously it's going to be a negotiation between the executive branch and the companies, and that has to be ratified by the legislature. What I would like to see, not to add any kind of confusion, I would like to have some input from the legislature up front. But in regards to taxes, I know the law announced has stated that the two cents per barrel has been unacceptable. And if you go back in the history, the two cents per barrel was not initiated from the event from the from Holy or Hess Oil. It was an agreement that the individuals who negotiated on behalf of Juan Luis administration agreed to. I think Hess was willing to give, it was approximately $60 million with the potential to bring back an additional $60 million from the you know from the the, the, the excise tax generated from oil, and the Louis administration refused that based on information that they had that it finally could generate 750,000 barrels a day, which wasn't the truth, and they they agreed to the two cents per barrel. So it was the negotiators on our half that did a poor job, and not the the S oil half. Okay, but the follow-up is. Let's assume a new com company is coming in. I think that's what this question addresses. And they want benefits from the territory. What would you suggest that be done in lieu of giving the tax breaks as far as them paying taxes on property and loans that they that currently exist that probably be used? Well, I, think, I think it's all in one big blanket. I don't think there's going to be a separate agreement for homes in cottage or in pearl or in, or in blessing. I think it's going to be a holistic agreement. Uh, ultimately, I would like to ensure that, that our people are safe, that the equipment is upheld, that the, that the OSHA permissible limits that are leaving the stack are tested on a regular basis to ensure that we're safe. So I don't think any additional taxes, but I think we have to come to the table with a win-win agreement, both for the company and for the people of the Royal Islands. I think we've stated that the two cents per barrel has been unacceptable in the past. We have to come to agreements. But I think both parties are willing to leave the table happy. Okay, Candidate Barnes, uh, tax breaks in lieu of taxes to the new company about this property? 
the, the first thing I want to say in reference to what my good friend here, uh, Mr. Henry Gaines, stated, I was able to speak to an economist, and one of the biggest problems that happened when we made that negotiation, as you say, two cents per barrel, uh, what the economist said it should have been two cents per gallon, because we don't sell gas by the barrel. So that was the first mistake. Um, secondly, we have to understand that for Venza, it is a private company. And when you are negotiating with a private company, you have to understand that there is going to be some give and, a, and some takes. Now, when you speak of giving them tax benefits, if you want to give them tax benefits, then you as a negotiator have to know what is it you want for the people of the Virgin Islands in lieu of what you're giving these breaks for. I think a lot of times our negotiation is done from a position of weakness. We always believe that if, 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 if we don't give them what they want, then they're not going to come. And that is not true. People negotiate because they want to get the bank for their book. So we, in turn, and when I say we, what is the government and the financial, even another private company, another entity, the next ever, we have to negotiate understanding what is it that we want for our people. What do we want for the masses? Not necessarily what deal works for a selected few. It has to benefit the masses of people. The governor played, played a big role in forcing this extension agreement. But you would as governor, you'd be a little bit tougher with anything that came down the pipe. The, the first thing I want to say, when, as a governor, I'm going to recognize that I am a leader. I am a leader. And there are people within my administration that are going to be hired to do certain jobs. The, the thought that everything that happens in the Virgin Islands, the governor has to be at the helm, that's not the case. And a lot of times, it's not necessarily the governor proper sitting in these negotiations. It's persons that he has hired. And so you just have to have the subject matter experts and the expertise that you need when these negotiations are happening to be at the table, as well as other stakeholders. I can't understand, and, and it's something that just can be asked. Why is it that people from the Virgin Islands can be a part of the process? I'm not saying everybody come in, but you have to get a, a, a cross-section of your community so that you can get a sense of what is actually happening. Another thing you can do, we should not come all meetings prior to a lot of these uh, events taking place so that the government and the people that are going, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, so, you, so your point is get the people involved and don't do it like you did it last time. Sheila, do you agree with that? I think it's a very wise to have, to have a town meeting and to see what people think. To see what people think. Okay. Uh, and to really get the input from people. This keeps coming on the block. I'm going to fix the problem. Six months or a year from now 
may or may not be true. Go ahead, your deal. Um, basically, when someone comes in and makes an offer to buy something as big as the oil refinery company, those negotiations are very serious. And I think it's a great idea to have town meetings and to hear from the people and to see what insight and what recommendations people have. And then also when the agreement is drawn up, maybe there should be four people chosen in the Virgin Islands who have the kind of quality intelligence that can look at both sides and pass the deal to each person before the before the decisions made so that you know the input is there. Okay. It appears at this point. Uh, any backup coming? Sure, go ahead. It, it's not really a rebuttal, but it's in regards to education of people. You know, I happen to work in a venture finance for 20 years. And even though I worked with the agencies, there was a lot of information that wasn't released to the individuals that worked here. And I think we have to have more transparency, especially for the people outside the gates of Obensa. And we know that the reports that were given to the governor and the legislature in regards to, to what the refinery should I'm going to ask a very short question. Do you believe that Obensa, because it's dormant, should turn over some of the CPA credits to allow WAPA to move to the South Shore? Give yes or no. I sincerely doubt that private companies don't give up any of these credits. But I think as leaders of the Virgin Islands, we need to go to the EP and demand that we get more credits. So look at the pollution over St. Croix. Houston on its best day is not as good as St. Croix and its worst day with a monster at National Federal So I think the leaders should be fighting on behalf of these companies and not trying to give up anything. Can okay, with arms? How about those EPA credits? As far as the EPA credits, it's, it's an asset. That's, that your, that's your field. Right? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Talk, talk to all you want. It, it's an answer to the company, and simply it's a process that has to be negotiated. Right. It, you know, the question, you're, I'm hearing what you're asking me, but you still have to remember that opens, it is a private company. And to just say, to go to them and tell them to give up some of the credits, I, I'm telling you, that is not how it works. Okay. That is just not how it works. Now, let's talk about Renaissance, because Renaissance was willing to sit and negotiate with the government mm -hmm. concerning moving water over on the South Shore. So then we have to ask the question, don't look at the so look at a company that is willing to negotiate. The problem is you cannot ask a private company to give you something for free when it's an asset to them. You have to negotiate the sure. process. And the Archer did essentially that with Renaissance. Correct. Okay. Uh, Sheila? Basically, I think it, it always does come down to decent, fair negotiations where you're not just looking out for yourself, but you're really extending some, some caring and, and intelligence to the other side as well so that both, both parties feel they have a sound deal. If the deal is good, the deal will stand. If someone feels cheated five days later, then you're just generating a lot of bad karma and it's not, not a good thing. Okay, we can't have any bad karma at an election, that's for sure. If uh, you win, we've heard so many so much talk over the years about the CFO, CFO, CFO is the only answer to Virgin Islands fiscal problems. If you win, will the CFO bill be on the table for consideration with the new administration? Do you start with when? I don't even need to take three minutes. That's a no. We don't need a CFO. We, we have a government that is set up where we can handle our affairs. It doesn't matter to me where it comes from. We do not need a CFO. We have it built into our present government where the persons it, it comes down to checks and balance and accountability. That's the bottom line. We have to encourage and or force people to do their jobs. And if they're not doing their jobs, then we say we have to have them replaced. But we don't need a chief financial officer to come to tell us how to handle our fears. We just got to ensure that the persons that are responsible are, are comfortable to handle our affairs financially. Okay, uh, John Cavietta, you and Judge Yase Coco talk a lot about corruption. How do you deal with corruption without some kind of oversight apart from the local government? Well, absolutely. Uh, we spoke of creating a task force within the government. We're not going to hire any new people. 
I think the Office of Inspector General is going to play a key role. Right now, they are underfunded, under budgeted, undermanned. They issue about two reports every year. We want to work with the Inspector General on this very closely, follow their lead, create this task force separate from the Attorney General. We think the Attorney General's position is too important. He should be involved. He does the final prosecution. But we want to have a separate prosecution force, which is basically this task force, to hold individuals accountable. And even going further than that, we know there's individuals, there's commissioners and directors that terminate people illegally. That is a form of corruption also. And these individuals need to be accountable on their level. So if it's the commission that's committed, obviously he reports to the, the office of the governor. We should be taking care of that. But in regards to criminal activity, and I'll be specific, like individuals with Officer Taffy over in, in St. John's or Officer Hill, the heads of the police department, the heads of, of DPNR, these individuals need to be held accountable for their actions. Six years for running, the multiple amount of drugs that was trafficked in the islands is unacceptable, and we know there's corruption. So your administration would protect whistleblowers? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I think, okay. I think the press should have a very important part also. I think the press should have a lot of transparency. They should be allowed within the offices to do some additional investigation to hold us accountable to the people. So of those of you who say no CFO, okay? Uh, no CFO. No CFO. What about you, Sheila? Um, I respectfully disagree. I like the idea of a chief financial officer. I feel that there are probably, well, there was one, one senator, and I don't remember what the senator's name is, but he mentioned there should be a person who examines the numbers coming out of the executive branch and examines the numbers coming out of the legislature branch. And, those, and to get those numbers right and that both parties are in agreement and there's no denial around the numbers. A lot of times there's all these projections. I don't really like projections. I like what's real. What really is coming in? What is, where, where, where is the money going? And with respect to um, like a lot of the slippery stuff that goes on with money, I think it cheats the people out of some really important projects. So there needs to be someone who really examines those numbers in a very serious way. And if there's a lot of nonsense, it needs to get cut out. Okay, there you go. Okay, go ahead with your follow-up. When, I, when the Barnes Corporation speaks of restructuring government, it's just not personnel, but it's also processes. Because there is approximately, I think about 12 or 14 uh, different, as you call them, chief financial officers in different divisions within government. But none of them speak directly to the Commission of Finance. That in itself is a problem. The systems don't talk to each other. That's another problem. So it's not so much a person as opposed to working the system as well. Okay, next question. Wherever you go, whenever the government seems to take over a building, maybe they got from the federal government or donated to it, they fall into disrepair. There's a lot of data, including the buildings that are re required right now that house government offices. They're in terrible shape. Who should be taking care of the maintenance of these buildings? The government, public works, or should it be privatized? Let me go to John first. Oh, okay, let me repeat the question. Who should maintain government buildings? The government itself, or should they be privatized uh, by contracts, as it's also done in some cases? Who should be taking care of all of these dilapidated government properties? Remember the Toro building, you remember Fort Louis Augusta, which is a historic monument? It's in shambles, it's a sport. Who should be doing this? Go ahead, John. Yes, uh, I think it's a fine balance. I think um, some of the major issues, um, let's say like sewage, where we have very capable people in public works, I think it's a little bit cheaper to institute the government agency to help with that. I think some of the minor maintenance, I think the commissioners and directors should have in their budget some of the money to hire some of the private people. Now, I believe that these, these, these contracts should be audited on a regular basis to ensure that somebody is not receiving a $10,000 contract to, to cut the grass where it's only really valued at $2,000. Okay, our, our team, the Cold Cup County, think we talked about the principles. Right now, the principles, they want to cut the grass cut or something repaired, simple, changing light bulbs. 
they have to put in a requisition and have property permit approval to come down. I think the principal should be responsible for for some of the minor maintenance and some of the issues, the simple issues that they care within the schools. And I think that should be the same way throughout the government government agency. So a combination of public works and private industry, I think we can balance it out to make sure that our buildings are, are evaluated and protected over a period of time. No, no, no. I'm trying to speed it up here because we're running short. Right. Um, when we speak of government buildings um, and then opposed to contracts, uh, the first thing we should do is utilize our government buildings if they can be used and stop giving all these contracts that are negotiated prior to the election and then it happens afterwards. So that's my first thing. As far as government buildings that can be used, you have to look, you have to do an assessment because some buildings, it is easier to tear it down. It's easier and it's actually cheaper to actually tear it down and build from scratch as opposed to try to maintain or rebuild it from the state in which it's in. So you have to take each building um, individually, but for the buildings that government employees occupy, especially if it is truly a government building, then it's their responsibility to maintain that building. And even if you are renting or from another uh, a contractor, it's still their responsibility to maintain the building. That is part of what will help you with the employees, ensuring that they don't get sick. You know, I was to a school uh, last week, a half an hour into the forum, my eyes started burning profusely, sure. letting me know that they was only that building because my, eye, my body is very sensitive to the power. So, Hurricane, <coughs> Hurricane Gonzalo comes, hits a Croy, knocks down and destroys a lot of government buildings. With your experience in the National Guard, do you think the National Guard should play a role in the restoration of the storm of these buildings? Well, we, well, we don't have a choice, but the key that people have to remember concerning the National Guard, the National Guard doesn't have every specialty that everybody wants during a disaster. There are actual set units within the Virginia National Guard that does, uh, you know, specific work. I heard someone on the radio last week and they were saying after Hugo, the National Guard didn't come and help put up poles. Well, there's not a designated, in the engineering unit that we have, that's not their specialty. Their specialty was moving the green, you know, and, and just clearing. We had equipment for clearing, not for actually putting up poles. So the key we must understand is the Virgin Islands is an entity of about 742 to 750 members. But they're all specialties, and it doesn't have a specialty for every desire that they're going to have. Absolutely correct. In fact, in Alabama, the National Guard is specializing in power restoration, and that's why we're here doing what they did after the storm. Go ahead, Sheila. What do you think about building maintenance? I just, I just wanted to say this. Um, building maintenance costs money, and something that we should really pay attention to is that there's about $700 million that comes into the general fund. What you have is you have health care insurance at $150 million. You have debt service at about $180 million. You have payroll and other benefits, and this is just a guess. I'm guessing it's somewhere around $400 million for the whole government employee group. So you don't have a lot of money left over. That's a big, a big problem. And I feel that in order to get it right, many adjustments have to be made. And I think if the strength could come from the Virgin Islands, it may take other people 20 years to catch up with us. But I think we really need to make the spiritual adjustments to make people's lives better rather than living with all the madness that everybody's been living with for the last 20 years. I've got a quick question for each of you. If elected governor, if elected governor, you hear me all right? If elected governor, where do you plan to live? If I become governor, where I plan to live? Mm -hmm. My in understanding that, in the house, I that in the house, I my run. understanding is that there's a house in Hattiesburg in St. Thomas, and that is where the governor lives, and that's where I will live. With the days I have to come to St. Croix, I'll be at government house on the third floor. And if I don't do that, I'll be back at work and rest with my mom with a house in which I own. Oh, so also you don't have to worry about where uh, Governor Barnes is going to live because any housing that the governor 
it and it's prescribed for the governor. I can live in it. I can flow it and I live in tents and cuts for years. So as far as where I'm living, it's a non-issue. Okay. By the way, there's a nice government house at uh, Long Farm. Go ahead, John. Yes, sir. Well, pleasure to take, right? Well, well, fortunately, I'm the lieutenant governor, so I get to live on City Coy. I'm happy for that. <laughs> but I think we mentioned, I think the question's been asked to um, candidate Cole Bell to the past, and she said that she would live, she would live within, um, within the confines of the government. Which is but she has such a wonderful place on St. Thomas. Why would she not want to live in her home? You know, you'll have to ask her that. But okay. I'm, I'm sure she'll be happy to stay here also. She has a beautiful place, by the way. Go ahead. I would definitely live on St. Croix. St. Croix would be my priority. You live on St. Croix? Right? At Government House? Upstairs on the third floor. Okay. As long as you let me come and play the grand piano, that's all right. All right. It's my understanding that the Hovenza Channel restricts other vessels from using the channel, meaning the Port Authority and other vessels would have to seek permission to travel through the Hovenza Channel. If the incoming administration chooses to build a transship port on the South Shore, we will run into the same problem. How do you plan to correct this? Uh, it's part of the agreement, by the way, that Obenza has insurance uh, requirements and they have been given the exclusive access. John, you know about this. You know, I, I don't know how accurate that is because I don't know if any private entity that actually owns any shorelines or any waterways within the large lands. I think the, the Coast Guard or the EPA has some access to that. So I don't know how accurate that question is, but with regards to the waterways, the government would have to push and They would be in a, in a position where they can negotiate with the Coast Guard, a federal agency, or with EPA So I don't think that's a very accurate question sure. in regards to events that are restricted in the So Mona can bring her yacht into the escort and get some fuel and buy some groceries and things before going back out to St. Thomas. Well, again, I'm not sure about you making me laugh. <laughs> I won't get a yacht, I'll get a baby first. But anyway, I can't truly really speak to it because I don't know for a fact what you're saying is a fact. So it's something that we would definitely have to negotiate. But Mr. as Mr. Kandidata said, it, you would definitely have to speak with the Coast Guard and GPNR because they have uh, you know, they, they, are, they are cover that area, but to say that I know for a fact what you're saying, I do not. But I truly believe, again, and I go, if I go hypothetically with what you're saying, it's very hard for me to see it. But if it is so, it goes back again to when we make these negotiations. It, we have to ensure when we are doing things, we look at the whole picture. A lot of times we're very centralized into one issue. But we have to look at, and what we don't look at is the, the effects that it's going to have on the masses. One, and we don't look at the effect that it's going to have on our environment as you speak to, to walk away. So we just have to be very uh, careful in our negotiating, and if that is a fact, that is something that we definitely will have to look into the bonds program. So the favor access of that port to interest that benefit the territory apart from the refinery. Well, if we can have access to it, why not? Okay. Why not? Sheila? I, I love the idea of a transshipment port, but again, I think we have to be realistic about money. And uh, sometimes little miracles happen. Dr. Cathoria came in with a $30 million gift for the medical school. It was a true miracle. Sometimes things can be negotiated when people want things for different reasons, so it all has to be looked at. But I, I'm not okay. sure. Now, this question, big bucks. I assume that means a lot of money are being spent on electioneering, winning elections. By law, candidates for the elected offices must file financial reports with the board of elections. But at the present time, there are no such requirements for political action committees, or PACs as they're called. And with their funding of radio and TV ads, we have groups like the I Restore Hopelessness and the uh, I Restore Hope, all running ads, contributing to the Do you? What position do you take that uh, that we should put some limits on political action groups? Now, John, you're an expert on political action groups, <laughs> having raised millions. I, I wouldn't say raised millions. Um, yes, I do have some knowledge of 
if you're a fact the most amount of money, you can accept for one individual is $5,000. If you're a recognized political party, you can accept $10,000. As senators and governors, and it says a former central aspirant, I raised probably twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. The majority of that was my money, and all of that was filed in a timely manner. I think every act needs to follow the law. If we're going to be the leadership of the government, you know, who has declared a war on corruption, we're talking everybody has to be accountable. The money trail should be should be followed, and all that information should be recorded and presented to the board of elections. It's that simple. Uh, no. The bar is still on touch. The bar is going to be um, very heavy in our campaign speaking of transparency. And I know you have patterns, and some people don't want to be identified because um, at times in, in past governments, uh, repercussions have actually given to. You mean retaliation? Uh, repercussions. Okay. For, for probably given to uh, one over the other. So it's a very, it's a very thin line. I think that we will have to, to uh, revisit and take a look at. But I am truly uh, transparent. I truly believe that um, if I do something, it's because that is my desire, and, and I make it known. Uh, we ensure that uh, for the Barnes Forum team, you know, we file everything that is required by the, the Board of, of Elections. But we have to be careful because sometimes uh, some people are entitled to their privacy, especially when they're given. So that is something that we will just have to do. But my follow-up, what if they're making vicious, scurrilous lies against a candidate? The but that's, that's, see, again, and they're invisible. Show, I have to say this to you. Again, you're making assumptions. Um, people don't necessarily just give to a party because of something negative. Some people give because they truly believe in that, that group or what is the Senate or gubernatorial candidates and they want to see them move forward. So the, the, the fact of people coming out with negative or positive, that's a personal issue. And we're not we're not going to change it because that's human being. And let me let me because you know something is I don't know how much time we'll get because then we'll give an opportunity to do a follow-up. Let us be let us be sure that what we need in our political process is honesty and integrity. And, and like I said, I am not getting any back and forth. The Barnes Forum team, if you hear any of our ads, you see any of our commercials, we are simply trying to promote what it is we want to do for the people of the Bergenlands. Now, there are other groups that are doing, and, and I found out something very interesting, that even with some of these ads, they can do what they want. They can actually, uh, do an ad for or against you and just say, say it's by them. So we can't, those are people that are making decisions for or against a candidate. So you know, I, was, I hear what you're saying. I was going to do some ads for a candidate. They asked me not to because they didn't want to lose votes. So, <laughs> right? uh, so my point there again, my point there again is shouldn't the, the government, the gubernatorial candidate be responsible as much as they can for their message without having this extraneous gunfire all over the place, Sheila? Well, yes, and I think that the five teams running have been pretty closely just saying their own message. There's been a little bit of fighting between two, but for the, for the most part, people have been pretty clear about their message. Okay. You have another comment? Yes, I have to go back again. Perhaps they don't have to get your permission on what they're going to say for or against you. You know, and, and I will tell you, it was last week uh, because someone's and I, you know, someone came and said there's a group that wants to, um, you know, have you put more uh, commercials out, but they want to tell you um, what to say. I said, well, I don't want them, and I don't want that sure. because I want to ensure that our message. Be Maintain and it's clear with the Barnes Forum team, we are about moving I, the Virgin Islands. I, I personally, I, I hate to cut you short. To a, I personally would love for to better have, quality of life. I personally would love to have a gubernatorial candidate someday say, I disavow that nonsense. Look at my content 
look at my content and judge it for what it is, but these other things on the side I'm not dealing with. But we haven't ever heard that. People are willing to accept almost any kind of manure that could be jumped up in an election. Let me go to the next question. Did, do you believe, and I understand you do believe it because I heard your message, do you believe that there is corruption in our government and what do you intend to do about it? The state? No, no. The job. That was, what, that was your I story. know you're a Republican, but you gave in John the first No, I want to start from that end. Thank you. Hey, listen. Listen. He, he defeated me, and you didn't vote against me, but he did. So, so go ahead. But it changes nothing. We call it a democracy, or people go to polls, and I have to get more polls to go. I'm not going to apologize for that. How many more? <laughs> Eleven. That's because of all of you weren't Republicans and didn't vote for me. So go ahead, John. So. In addition to the task force we talked about creating, we want to hold individuals accountable on every level. If a commissioner dismisses somebody or fires somebody illegally, they will be held accountable for their actions. If individuals commit crimes of bribery or sales of drugs, we will hold them accountable. Alvin G. Excuse me, Alvin G. Alvin Williams. Alvin Williams was convicted. There are still 19 sealed affidavits that have not been opened up, and we're convinced that there's individuals possibly seeking position of office who are named in those sealed documents. We don't want the federal government to lead us, but we do want the federal government to assist us. As Virgin Islanders, we plan to take the lead in addressing corruption, in addressing the prosecution of individuals who are, who are held in contempt who are held responsible for smuggling drugs and who are held in regards to stealing money from the people of the Virgin Islands. Okay, but the what the specifically government. are your plans to correct it? Something like a task force or, or what would you do to correct the we existing did. problems in almost many, many of the government agencies? Well, we did we discuss that. We discussed that the problem is individuals are, felt, are, are found out and then they're not held accountable. They're slapped on a wrist and they're moved from one agency to the Department of Agriculture or moved from one agency to some other agency. That will not happen under the court of any agency. Yeah. Okay. Command Sergeant Barnes, I'm sorry. Uh, when, when you speak to corruption, I go back again to leadership. And, and the head first has to be right. And not just set the example. They have to be the example and you have to give everyone in a prospective position and opportunity to do their job. That, that's part of the problem. And so when, it's, when we speak to corruption, you know the Barnes Forum team will not uh, tolerate corruption. Uh, it will be dealt with. I, I say before, uh, you're not going to be eradicated, but you have to be and set the example. And you prove the persons that are in the positions, what happens is when you find out that corruption is being had. You have to immediately address it. And like um, John said, don't move them from position to position. And you can no longer uh, say, well, they were part of my campaign, or, or, or they're, they're, my, they're my cousin, mother, brother. When they come to the job place, they become employees and servants of the government and the people of the Virgin Islands. Sure. I believe that there is government and corruption here as well as other places. And I feel it's not just the stealing or the corruption, but it's what it does to people's thought process and the fact that they can't focus on their work and focus on the service that they're supposed to be doing if they're very busy being corrupt. So I think if people really got their spirits clean and their heads straight, that we might be able to get some work accomplished. Okay, every administration comes in, normally fires a whole bunch of people. I was fired twice by two Democrats, got my job back by a third court. But the, the question is, why is this constant cleaning out of exempt employees, of non-classified employees, by the new administration? Are they that hungry to fill those positions with political acts? Or would you do the same thing? Wouldn't you look based it on merit rather than on political expediency? Well, the Barnes Court team, we have always said from the very beginning, our process of hiring is going to be a little different than most. 
Now, I truly believe that if someone, after November 4th, election is over, it's now time to work. And if someone is seated in a position and they're productive, it no longer matters whether they vote for the virus quarantine. Because what it is, is taking care of the people of the Virgin Islands. I sat down with Dr. Corwin and with my committee and I said to them, as we go through our transition team, when uh, resumes begin to come in, I don't want to see names. I want to see qualification. And then from that, we will take three, maybe four uh, of those applicants and then sit down with them individually. Also, uh, we must remember everyone that's on this panel, they're running for a political office. And so the thought process becomes the same. So why would I not ask another uh, group that weren't successful, uh, who did you have in mind, or did you have somebody in mind for this position? Or this, because we're all thinking the same thing. If we truly want to do what is best for the Virgin Islands, after the election, all of us, if we're truly concerned about the people of the Virgin Islands, should be able to sit down, and I know everybody said, well, it's a fine time. No, it's not. You just have to change your mindset and the way that you want to do business. I can sit and talk with, with, with uh, Lieutenant Governor Mapp, a uh, delegate to Congress, Diaz and Shima, and said, look, what do you think is the best for this area? Because at that time, it's not about the bonds quarantine. It's about what is best for the people of the Virgin Islands. Okay, John, uh, you won't be able to, okay, John, you won't be able to fire me because I've retired, but what would you do? Would you, would you clean house and bring in your own people, or would you look elsewhere to solutions? You just answer the question, seems like I'm a I think I'm capable as a one to ask for the answer. position, and I can answer it effectively. We've definitely discussed this among our team. We look at a community of approximately 100,000 people. We have approximately 7,000 government employees. There are agencies that are working well. I think we'll use the Department of Tourism, where Commissioner Dell, she's very proactive. She's trying to bring the jobs, bring tourism back to the Boys Mounds. And instead, not knowing all the facts, we would say, based on her objectives and based on her meeting goals, she would keep that position. We don't want to fire a clean house because it's a small community. These are our brothers, our family members, our, you know, our, our friends who have families who rely on us. But individuals who are not doing their jobs, and I can say specifically that Tony Jenna is doing a poor job in this position, and he will be removed. Okay. And if you've noticed, we have a crime problem, but there's no plan to address the crime situation on St. Corey. I think the police commissioner should be removed immediately. What about, uh, let me add to this, everybody here feels, I'm sure, if you don't start booing, that one of the biggest thieves in the Virgin Islands, the Virgin Islands are in power authority. You all agree? Would you replace the executive director if you the administration came in? I, I hope you didn't call him a thief. No, 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 no. I, I didn't call him a thief. I said people believe that they have been robbed by WAPA. I'm not calling anybody personally. But would you replace the executive director who has served for many years but has not done the job? The answer right now is we don't know that. I'll tell you right now, the people have been dealt on fear for 54 cents a kilowatt is still one hour. Per kilowatt hour, per kilowatt. The people understand that they're paying 54 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay. It's atrocious. But you didn't, you didn't, you didn't let me have finished that. I believe that we need to have an audit because I believe that there have been some shenanigans taking place in Wapa. Specifically, I'll give you one example. There was a company that bid for the White Bell project. This is not a complicated project. This is a concrete foundation, a tank to send propane to, to the, the gas boilers. They were bid at $15 million and was thrown back. They came back for a 50, a, a $18 million bid and was thrown back. And it was given to a company from St. Thomas for $24 million. I am convinced that there's shenanigans taking place in Wampa, and that would have to be investigated before anybody would stay or be removed. A local company, Revolt, Revolt, who has got the biggest craze in the Virgin Islands, built on that and lost to a German company 7,000 miles away. So there's shenanigans taking place. Ms. Mohan, you said you were going to answer. Yes, I was. 
You can't necessarily speak to personnel or a person when they're running and controlled by a board. So you got to address the board and, and what is happening on the board. That's then in turn happening with employees within the system. So it's not, it's not like, you know, Mona Barnes being the president of FSH Enterprises and I'm able to call all the shots for my company. That's not what it is. There's a board. So we got to look at the board and we have to look at not just the WAPA board, all the other boards that we have within the Virgin Islands. Of which you are. Well, I am, I am on, on some words. But if the fact still remains, it's just not the person. Because there's some things that people want to change as a director, but it doesn't, it doesn't gel with the board, and then it doesn't happen. Well, listen, if I ran on a campaign of free love and nickel beer, and I couldn't ever deliver that, do you think I could react it? This is what a uh, trigger on expert came in and said we're going to make things better and they only got worse. Sheila, what about what, Wapa? Would you replace the, look for another manager or try to recommend one to the board, a CEO of the Virgin Island Water Power Board? Well, I would have to do a very serious evaluation of him and the job and the objectives that he had when he came in. Um, but, but most importantly, I, I'd like to share my philosophy on that. Um, I think there are a lot of people who serve on boards that shouldn't be there. I think they waste a lot of time making one another unhappy and sick. And I think that I would ask for real self-evaluation for people to be in the job that they want to be in, be on the board that you want to be on. If you don't want to be on any boards, then don't be on any boards. But for people to really do a soul-searching evaluation in light of what you're really good at, how you want to serve, and I would open up many jobs, and I would actually put the price tag on people that I really value in light of the natural intelligence and the uh, ability that they have. So nobody's willing to fire a few more hours. Okay, fine. So, the, one, the one thing I want to add as well, even before they get on the boards, there's a process when it goes through the legislature as well. So it, it's a whole process. It, it, it's just not a, you know, that cookie cutter cut that you're, you're trying to say, oh, you just get rid of it. You got to be very careful with that. Sure. But uh, Bruno Wapa Vega, Bruno Vega, a person experienced many years in power generation, got the letter in the mail, or got the phone call, and was gone. They brought him back again, but then he was gone again. But again, we have another follow-up question that's very short. Do you believe in privatization of power generation, John? Uh, absolutely. I think it's the, it's the way of the future. I think we're definitely going to have to, to privatize some points. We've already done that. In regards to the Toshiba project, Wi-Fi is not true. It's cement power. Excuse me? And the water project. Yeah, well, I was about to say that also in 17. Once again, thank you very much for answering your questions. You may not be heard. But yeah, so Toshiba is producing about, is going to produce about 4 megawatts worth of power. They are going to be responsible for the maintenance. So in, in this, they have already privatized the, the electrical generation. They've done that with a water system. WAPA no longer makes water via desalinization plants. They hired seven seeds. They buy the water from seven seas and then resell it to the Bojans. Once again, we have to investigate that because I've heard that it fees that seven seas charge is very low and WAPA charges an enormous price per gallon, per thousand gallons for water. That's what they're good at. So, so they're moving, they're already moving towards privatization. Okay. At some point, we definitely have to move the power facility over to the South Shore. Thank you. New technology. Move forward. What are the I don't believe in privatizing uh, I do not. No part of the sure. Well, there's some, well, because we're diversifying, it's evident that some private companies have a part, but one for proper, I do not believe in privatizing. It might be of interest that my fault energy is going to have an 11-year agreement to do everything themselves and then provide the benefits to WAPA. Um, sorry, Sheila, I didn't use all of my time. When we move WAPA to the South Shore, 
it can still belong to the children. Absolutely. It, it can. The, the, the thought of we have to prioritize it because it's not being managed well, or the thought that it's not being managed well right now doesn't mean that the government cannot manage it properly. The, the, not of it, the big issue with what it is, it is outdated and it's inefficient. The power Period. That's, that's, the, that's the hard building. Well, my question was regarding power production only, not the line department, the building department. But, yeah, but, but it, it all speaks to power production. Yes, it does. Sheila, your comments. Yes, I have, I have no problem with privatization and I have no problem with WAPA holding on to it. It's whatever needs to be done to get the electric cost down is the road we should travel because it's killing small business. And there are many technologies, both in renewable energies and in new showcases that uh, enlisted a billion dollars in thorium, which is holding the popular hand of the power reactor for 30 years. And these boxes will be available soon. And they will certainly be the answer if somebody's making electricity for five cents a kilowatt hour. Do you think anybody here would be against? That production, I don't know. At any rate. Okay, why didn't the aspiring candidates speak out on our problems on talk shows or other venues prior to running for office? Now, I invited you to be on my talk show many times and you had scheduling difficulties. Sheila uh, also was invited, but she was down eating a beignet at, at the bistro, didn't come upstairs, but Everybody's invited to be on my talk show, and some people found it difficult to get on other more popular talk shows. So the question is a valid one. Uh, if, but, but you are charged with the responsibility of speaking out on our problems on talk shows. I guess the question is, why didn't you call in talk shows for a few years prior to running? Well, well see again, your question... I've been invited to talk shows. I've been, I've done seminars. I've done conferences. Uh, we have to understand, based on that question, talk shows are not always the avenue that you go to to resolve issues. And so, uh, I have uh, one of the reasons why I'm running for governor is because I've always had a voice and a say when I see things that I think is is not right. So it, it, it's not just the talk shows. So I've been on talk shows before, so that's not uh, relevant to me. You know what, I think the question is, why weren't you flooding talk shows with calls? Because flooding talk shows with calls doesn't always bring results when you can actually go to an entity, and that's the other thing. You can go to an entity, sit down, and resolve issues that never come to the radio station. So there's a lot of things okay. that the Barnes Quarantine has resolved without ever having to come Good to a radio station. One, in, in, and if I have a time to talk about that a little, is that same CMS uh, issue at the hospital. The Barnes Quarantine, we stay right here in St. Croix, and we made a call to the D.C. area. And the Barnes Corbin team was the team that was able to get Mr. Dennis Smith to be in conversation with the present uh, CEO of the hospital. And so I didn't have to go on the talk show for that. My concern was the people of the Virgin Islands and made a direct call. I didn't have to fly. I just simply made calls and they were able to speak directly. Now, if they take the recommendation, that's totally different. But I must say it here, the Barnes Quorum team was very instrumental in allowing CMS, and I know it for a fact, okay. that the CEO was actually able to speak with Mr. Dennis, who was the past director of you know. CMS. Wait, let me finish. Can they time me now? Who was the actual director of CMS, and he was the appointee of the present director of CMS. People, so, people are not being told of your direct involvement People are not being told of your direct involvement in what you did on that issue. The fact remains is maybe now it's time to go on a talk show so you can explain what you did. See, that's the thing again. It's not about explaining, it's being done. 
And if it benefits the people of the Virgin Islands, then I am good with that. You, you don't need to wear it on your sleeve around town. Okay, go ahead, Sheila. Herb, I don't remember receiving an invitation from you formally, so I, I was genuinely in preparation mode. I, I would be honored to be on the talk show and share whatever I can share to make the community better. But I also, too, um, I was very busy kind of working behind the scenes to try to get this medical school on board. And I had, I had meetings with John DeYoung and with Mr. Francis and with, the, uh, with Dr. Griffith, and I was very focused on that medical school. And sometimes you have to choose what your interests are and focus on those issues and not scatter yourself. And, you know, and the biggest tragedy is when people like you and uh, Command Sergeant Major, who is giving me a lecture, work hard on something only to have it fail by the big capital P, and that's politics. At the end result of all your work, it goes down the tube, or seems to. Uh, John, uh, you know, call me Bob Show, please. Well, this really is not right about the issue, whether you come on the talks or not. Right? Okay. There's no way that there's those that talk and those that don't feel like talking, but believe in action. But having said that, I volunteered five years of my life in the late 90s and early 2000s with Abdul Ali and brought my views and my opinions, and that's how we became known in our community. And when I was laid off from Obensa, I did about two years on and off with the Redfield show, and we've had you, you know, on the show at times also. What's your report? I don't, I don't, I don't think being on a, on, a, on a talk show is really important. I think, you know, there's some people who want to express themselves. Some people want to be confrontational. It's great. You know, I remember hope, holding a show for family one night in his absence. I remember co-hosting with him also. I think it's a great experience, but it's not a bread and butter issue. Okay. Our candidates should be held accountable you know, because they're not It's amazing, amazing that we have politicians who want to pick. Take advantage of free time on the radio. Because maybe they're busy actually doing the work of the people. And that's what's important. Okay, I understand. Enforcement is one of the biggest problems here in the government. Enforcement. Will you make a commitment to properly fund the Inspector General and Attorney General's office so they will be able to do their work? This is assuming they're not properly funded. John first. Repeating question, I heard. Uh, it's talking about enforcement. I, I guess they mean judicial enforcement of the law. Correct. So you make the commitment to properly fund the Inspector General. Now, I admit he's not properly funded, but the Attorney General's office uh, has a big budget. So they will be able to do their work. We've, we've actually made that commitment. Right? Not knowing exactly what the financial situation the government is, I think that's one of those small agencies that have a very small budget. I believe we can reorganize some funds to ensure that they produce more than the two reports that we're currently getting out of that office. You know, if I was to come and say, you know, I'm going to hire a thousand employees, like other candidates have done, that's very difficult to say that. You know, maybe they have a plan. So we haven't made a lot of promises on our campaign, on our campaign trail, but we have made a commitment to work closely to see the Inspector General specifically and to increase their office resources and budget. We have made that commitment. Okay, more of ours? I'm not sure of the, the budget. I know I saw it, but I can't remember it right now. But we have to look and see, not just, a lot of times we try to throw money at a situation. And sometimes it might not be money. It might be human resource. It might be personnel. Or the, not, not the, the type of person is a person that's in that position qualified to do the job. So what basically has to happen uh, at the Bronx Forum team, we continue to say, it has to have an assessment. You refer that to is, uh, Dr. Corum. Uh, a lot of people don't know her because she's not getting any spots that I've heard. Could you uh, introduce her to the, to the rest of us? I did already. Okay. I, did. I mean, she's a... a, a a teacher, a professor, an educator, right? Yes. Okay, I can't go to work for my research. And, okay, I understand. Now, the, <laughs> because, because when the ad comes out on the radio, it talks about the Barnes Quarantine, Barnes Quarantine. I said, Where, where's the quarantine? <laughs> okay. <laughs> do, you, the, do you feel, uh, Command Sergeant Major Barnes, that the Attorney General has a conflict of interest when it does rep represents government agencies and is supposed to represent people 
against the government? How can that ever work out when you have the same attorney in that office representing the governor when the people have a grievance against the king? Again, we're looking at people. Because I know other attorney generals. I remember when George Hall was an attorney general. It was very, very small then. I remember Jada Finchie was an attorney general. Did we have all the issues that we, we have now then? That's the question that we have to ask. You cannot go by a present person's performance and base it blankly on everything else. Okay. How do you get politics out of the AG's office, uh, Sheila? I think that's really difficult because the Attorney General's job is to represent true justice. And if one of the people has a case that really is against the government, that Attorney General has to be strong enough to really be an advocate for that case. But in real life, if he feels he has his first responsibility to the governor, that's when justice is not served. So it's really a very serious problem. Now this question refers to the fact that it costs you an arm and a leg to use the same time as just to conduct government business or go on a debate or whatever. Transportation, transportation. A lot of money, millions are spent on barges being built between them. Three and a half miles or 3.1 miles between St. Thomas and St. John. But we have nothing for St. Paul, except maybe on this special event. What would you do as governor to enhance transportation, specifically water, possibly water, high speed water, transportation between the two islands? It is my understanding right now that we have $3 million that's been sitting for six years in a fund that for a ferry between. St. Thomas and St. Croix. Once again, it goes back to leadership. The Coastal Candidate Team is not the type of leadership that is going to keep money and funds when the people of the Virgin Islands are suffering or being deprived, in this case, of transportation between the islands. There's a lot of other areas like that. I heard there's a fund where these uh, EDC companies have to put their money into the fund. They haven't even spent the money from last year, but they're asking for the money this year, but specifically back to transportation. We don't know our brothers and sisters across the world because it costs you 240 to $260 to get on a seaplane to get across there. Mm -hmm. If you're a Puerto Rican living in Vegas or vice versa, it might cost you about $45. So the no hard here is that. Right? It's, it's, it's hard, hard. hard. It's between the Echoes and the Labor. Uh, I'm sorry, the Echoes and Barge was what, two bucks or something? The, the Barge that a plane takes is less, is less than $75. Okay. So we have to address the reason why these costs are so high. But I believe that a barge, not a barge, it's a ferry between the islands are imperative if we're going to share in our culture and share in our heritage between all of the four islands of the Virgin Islands. Let me be add something because when I worked for Victor Fraser in Washington, we had intermodal money available for a massive transportation scheme similar to Alaska where people could get on, drive their cars on a boat and go all across Alaska. This should someday be possible between Puerto Rico, St. Thomas, BVI, St. Croix, but it seems to be an impossible mission. And there's federal money to pay for even a tunnel from St. Thomas to St. Croix, uh, St. John rather. Not, not the same way, of course, but we don't even have a single vote. What would you do for that? Would there be a privatized, privatization answer or a government answer? Well, um, what I would do is I would send out invitations to companies that are established in that kind of business and ask them to consider developing a company here. That way we wouldn't have to use government money. It would be a company coming in and providing that service. And you think it should be a free and open market service rather than a franchise? Free and open, free and open market. John, do you agree? A franchise or free, a free competition? Okay. Repeat the question. So do you think a, a facility taking people back for St. Croix and St. Thomas should be open competition between competing companies or should it be a franchise granted by the government? No, I mean, it, should, it should be open competition. I mean, obviously, as like I said, what's the most important thing? You have to make sure they have a facility that can safely transport the people back and forth to the islands. I think that's what we have our number one priority. I think it should be an individual who is competent, I think it's an individual who is on time and regular. 
I just wouldn't give it to anybody. I think there's established ferry transport organizations right now. We should just expand upon that. I don't think the government should be involved. But so at some point, it has to be regulated so it is affordable for, for transportation. Well, why is that? When the bank store team, we are actually, we actually sat with uh, investors that have families that are interested in doing uh, business in the Virgin Islands. So that is something that we are presently working on. The thing is to ensure that the cost, the personnel can uh, be able to afford it. It's not a, a cost that people cannot afford. And also, you know, it has to be competition. It does not just go right now, uh, traveling back and forth for this campaign. You know, you don't know when you're gonna get on Seaboard or when you're gonna cancel your flight. Mm -hmm. And you only have Seaboard and a few uh, flights with, uh, what's the name of the other company? Um, See, like K here, K here. So we have to, it needs to be driven by more competition and the stakeholders have to be involved where, when, as you have more businesses coming in, then your, your cost is going to decrease. But we have to ensure that we have the market as well, that the people can come and do business because people are not going to come and do business. And, for the, and, and it's first the territory, econ economically speaking, as well. I remember when Mario De Chabert, who's the founder of the Sunny Isle Shopping Center, had Baskin Robbins ice cream. And he couldn't get his ice cream back and forth between the two islands, they had Baskin Robbins and St. Thomas. So he got the belly dancer, which was a very, very fast boat. And he said, you want to go to St. Thomas? You can't make your flight, got an overnight here. Jump on board, I was here in 20 minutes. 20 minutes on a very fast boat. But there are answers out there that this is not rocket science, but yet we have today nothing between St. Croix and St. Thomas and the whole social fabric, whole economic fabric, my personal opinion, suffers as a result. Let me take this question here, uh, ferry transportation, done with. So, there's been a lot of considerable energy, a lot of energy expended in the public questioning the ethical behavior of elected officials. These are elected officials now, not government officials. Why should voters trust what you will do, or what you say you will do? How do you plan to be accountable and transparent to the public? I mean, will you open up your offices to the bright light of sunshine when you get elected? John first. Why don't you say no and get everybody excited? No, I'm not gonna say no. I'll say no to you. Okay. I think when we, when I, I did an interview with the Daily News, the Daily News first brought to my attention that there's a lot of translucency, no transparency within this administration. Yeah. And, and I thought that was just unusual. If you have made the mic, the media should be a friend, it should be a part of your administration. Because you want to be able to transmit your information to media so that people can understand what's going on. We know the kind of the COVID candidacy. We went through a hard time to even be on this ballot, where the individuals in the board of in the, in the election system told us that we couldn't run. And we had to take it to court. And the federal court here in the Virgin Islands stated that they were right and we couldn't run. And we just couldn't understand that reason. And we took that to the federal courts. It took them one month to decide that we couldn't run. And when we took them to the Third Circuit Court of Appeal, within hours, a three-judge panel said that they did not follow the rules and regulations of the law that was prescribed in our, in our local courts. They didn't have to go to the constitutional, constitutionality of it, and we were able to be on the ballot. So we believe that not only within the Board of Elections or, or the election system, but even within our local courts, there's some questionable behavior. Mm -hmm. And we should be held accountable from all levels. Okay. And that's why the Inspector General, we are accountable to the Inspector General, just like any other commissioner, attorney general, or anybody should be. Now, uh, Command Sergeant Major Barnes, you know in the military you have certain things you disclose, but cannot disclose. As governor, what would be the defining the line on that? Is this a follow-up to that first question? Yes, yes, my question. Yeah. Well, well, the first thing I would say, um, so, as an elected official coming in, you have to first look at where the person came from and look at their ethics, look at their character, look at their behavior from the past. And it should give you an indication of where they're going 
In the future, I've had a business in the Virgin Islands for 17 years. I, I have a church that I run for, that's been in existence for some 20 years. You know, my business would pay taxes. You, you never hear checks bouncing and those things. So it speaks to the character of who I am. But even going forward, uh, the Bible's quality, we speak again to integrity and transparency. And you, you never know, and that's why when, you, when you're in a society where a person is elected, you know, you, you hear what they say they're going to do. But like you said, when they get in, then it's that time for them to truly show what they're going to do. And I can speak for Dr. Corman and myself. We are actually running. We want to be your governor and lieutenant governor because we want to change the quality of life. And truly, we want to serve the people of the Virgin not serve ourselves. So as far as my integrity and my character, my thought, our thought is to be there for the people of the Virgin Islands. Okay, Shin. I think in many, in many situations you have to employ wisdom. I think complete transparency is a beautiful thing. I'm not afraid of complete transparency. But in many decisions, sometimes someone asks you to protect the truth or protect something. It's, it's, you have to be really careful. You can't just throw the truth around as if it's, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. You have to be very discerning and very careful with people. So I would just employ wisdom and look at each case as it, as it would come into my, into my office. Thank you for answering those questions. So we have uh, an issue here in the territory for the elderly and disabled people. Uh, in the past, they had been. Okay, Ms. Barnes, please leave. You want to answer one more question? Uh, this is on elderly and disabled people. In the past, we have put them away out of the, uh, and it's been, it's been miserable to see how elderly people have been treated. I hate to say this, but uh, we have disabled people in the streets that, that, that have to beg for food. What would your plans be as governor for really reaching out and making centers uh, for the handicapped or vocational rehab, shelter workshops, things like that? Would you take part in that? Well, even before I'm speaking of becoming governor, I would have to say as a pastor, we have already begun that process of actually taking care of the elderly in our community. Our church had gifted a portion of the church property to a comfort, well, to another entity, you like senior resort, where we have already built 14 apartments for the elderly. They're all, uh, none is vacant, and we are getting ready to transition to the second phase. It's actually a four-phase four project. So we've already started with that. Um, I do believe that we need to do more concerning the elderly in our community. They, they are, they're the ones that have paved the way for us, and we need to ensure that, that we take care of them. Uh, Dr. Corman already started uh, talking about an integrated facility, not just for wellness, but also for the elderly and, and for mental health and, and different uh, entities within, or different persons within our community. So that is something that we have already started already. It will just be a matter of continuing it with public and private uh, collaboration. A follow up to that is all across the territory, especially in our central business district, there are architectural barriers to people who are blind, who, who walk up and all of a sudden they find themselves on a four foot cliff, uh, ready to fall into the gut. Uh, our buildings are poorly designed, not for our present day needs, people in wheelchairs, not ambulatory. Uh, there, as you know, as an environmental specialist, uh, that there are some architectural barriers that have to be addressed. It can cost a lot of money, but is it worth it? It is definitely what it has to be done. And also, if you don't know, um, Sonny Barnes is my older brother. And I remember when he had a hard time transitioning in his wheelchair when the bike jump buses first came and they didn't have the ability for uh, a wheelchair, he basically just when the bike bus came, he would just wheel his chair right in front of the bus and they could not move. And you know, they're, they're standing up. 
no disability and no standing up because they are part of our community. And we have to be honest and say we neglected them. And we have to now change our, our mindset and change the paradigm of shifting to taking care of all people in our community because everyone in our community has worked, not because they have a disability. And, and to speak to that as well, when we were building um, the project at New Life Senior Resort, uh, when the inspector came, the railings were half an inch oh, um, under what the regulations said. And we had to go back for half an inch and replace the whole railing system to meet the specification. To meet the specification. And we had no choice because we wanted to ensure that we were following the rules. I remember when Sonny Barnes started the protest. Nobody, he did so because nobody else would come to help him. But he had to put his wheelchair in front of a white train bus to get attention so there was some action would be taken. But we should do better than that, right, John? Absolutely. And you need to leave right now? Well, listen, you're going to church tomorrow, you're a pastor. Would you please pray for the wisdom of the electorates and make sure that we make proper guidance and decisions? Ms. Barnes, I know you have another appointment. Thank you, on behalf of the board. So that's it's probably the last question. So you wait. Okay, well, thank you for sticking with us. Make it short as possible. The, the, the architectural barriers. Yeah, John, you're going to be the first I'll say the leaders have cuts. I think what we're trying to transition from this light to the next light. We are truly going to be judged by how we treat our children, our elderly, and our disabled. And I'm glad I'm not in that position right now. I'm glad I'm not going to pass away soon because we would be judged very poorly when we get to heaven. We have done a very poor job in regards to treating our disabled. Well, I'd like you, just to in conclusion, one last remark. I'd like you to talk about... Basically, what I wanted to say is I think it's really criminal how we have treated the homeless people suffering from mental illness in the territory, it's essential that the facilities are developed and before any outreach can take place, there has to be actual facilities in place and there has to be money for a supervised staff. And I really think as a Christian community that should be the first priority to really take care of the homeless and to, um, to have the facilities for, for the mentally ill. Right now, we don't even have a psychiatric unit at the Juan Louis Hospital, and some families go through very difficult situations. It really needs to be a priority. Ms. Barnes, you have a quick follow-up? No, I, I was going to do my closing. Okay. Right. All right, let's do that. Uh, when we start on the end, well, we need to go, right? Here, one, two more. Press the Good. Closing statement. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the VI Action Group for inviting us down here. Um, once again, I apologize for my, my mother may not being here, but we did have some technical difficulties with the flight speed and cancel from Seaborn. But having been with any other, at times I would have to step into that role, so I'm glad I was given the opportunity. You guys gave me that to just step in right here. I like your slogan giving power back to the people of the Bosch Islands. Our Constitution is for the people, by the people. And this is what we have to go back to, the simple elements. That government is not here because the people are supposed to serve us. We're supposed to serve the people in the Bush Islands. I know there's going to be long days ahead for the Pope of Kanyeda team. But guess what? I'm asking you for the opportunity to serve you. Warren Buffett said it best a few years ago in regards to our economy. He says, I do not like the direction in which our economy is going. And I can honestly say today, I do not like the direction in which our Virgin is going. We have been sucking salt for too long, and we need a new flavor. And the Cold Belt Candidate team wants to ask you to support us on November 4th because we want to be that breath fresh, of fresh air. We want to be that new flavor. We want to address energy and corruption and education and health care. But without your help, we can't do that. So on behalf of Soraya and myself, I humbly come before you during this interview process to ask you for your support. And by the grace of God, we will be here to serve you with honor and integrity. 
and be a part of the organization, be a part of our people, and we will acknowledge all of the groups like the VI Action Group in regards to not one, not now because we're asking for a job, but once you're elected, you are going to be a part of our team. So once again, thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless the Bulge and Islands. We are number one. On behalf of Dr. Corman, I said I want to thank the VA Action Group for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we say now is the time for a transformation. We cannot continue to do things the way we're doing it and expect a different result. Dr. Corman and I are here because we truly want to change the trajectory of the Virgin where we can improve the quality of life for the people of the Virgin Islands. We recognize and we understand that it's going to take more than us. It's going to take those commissioners, the directors that we hire to be a part of this process. And so we're asking you for your vote on November 4th. We're number four on the ballot. I'm asking you to please consider the farm score with me because we want to make the change and transformation that is needed in this work now. We are very heavy on dealing with the energy. We didn't get a chance to talk too much about the economic development, the health care, the edu education, and the physical security, as well as the crime in, in our community. We are here for the people. Our desire is to work with the people, as you said, for the people, and ensure that the Virgin Islands goes back to the place that it once was, where we could all live in, in harmony with each other. And I keep saying it on the trail. We have to begin to love each other and not focus on the dollar, but focus on the most important resource, which is the human resource. Again, we're number four in the ballot. God bless you and good afternoon. Thank you. On behalf of Robert Quinn and myself, I want to thank VI Action Group for inviting us here today. I think that this really is a critical time in the Virgin Islands history, and I really hope that all of you choose wisely. Right now, the crime, WAPA, and the GERS reform have to be tackled or I don't think we're going to be attracting new business here unless those elements really are dealt with. And I feel we really need to set the foundation for quality health care because we deserve quality health care. We can't keep doing the same old things over and over. We have to try something new and I think it needs to be documented over the next 20 years. So thank you all very much and thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. From VI, all the members of the VI Action Group, it was a pleasure having you today. And uh, this uh, debate will be uploaded to our YouTube page and we will push it, you know, a lot for the electorate to take a look at what was said here today. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. And can they always come out here?